Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Welcome to Dubai, a place where you can literally eat your way around the world. But I'm here because I want to discover the cuisine that evolved way before all these skyscrapers were even built. I love Middle Eastern food, but I do know I've still got a lot to learn. Wow, they are sweet, aren't they? So I'm on a journey through bustling cities and lush farmlands. And from glittering coastlines to harsh desert landscapes. If the scorpions or the snakes come, you can see they've been here already. To discover how so many communities have thrived here. 400 breads a day. Yes, you guys are busy. I'll be showing familiar favourites. It's never too late to learn how to make hummus. And sample new flavours. It's like the best kebab I've ever eaten in my life. And I'll be using that inspiration in dishes of my own. Well done, me. This time, I'll be tempted to do a runner. That is about a thousand quid. I'll become part of an Emirati family. OK, I'll be back the same time tomorrow. <laughs> and I'll cook a brand new dish of my own. As happy as Larry, he is. Dubai sits on the gulf between Saudi Arabia to the west and Oman to the east. The discovery of oil in the 1950s completely transformed the area into the global hub it has now become. Citizens of the United Arab Emirates are known as Emiratis, and in Dubai they make up less than 10% of the population. But that doesn't mean they haven't retained a distinctive culture and cuisine of their very own. It's the Muslim festival of Ramadan whilst I'm here, so many of the locals will be fasting during daylight hours. Dubai started its life here because of the riches of the Gulf pearl diving and fishing. And this fishing industry is still massively important to the Emirates today. And you do know, I love a market. I'm here to meet Emirati local Nazak El Sabak to explore the market and buy some essential ingredients for her speciality fish dish. How important is fish to the people of, of this area? Very important. We have fish 365 days a year. Well, I suppose if you, your place is, is a port, then fish is always going to be important. Exactly, yes. So what sort of fish is this? This is uh, tuna. In this area, the biggest I've dealt with is like uh, 16, 18 kilo. Wow. What are we going to use this fish for, Nazar? We will salt it. We will do malih. Malih? Malih. Malih, okay. malih is salted. Oh, OK. Is the word salted. In the old days, pre-electricity, our grandparents used to preserve it by salting. When in Dubai, do as they do in Dubai. So it's off to Nazek's house to get a behind-the-scenes look at the traditional Emirati practice of preserving fish, which must have always been a challenge in the heat of the Middle Eastern sun. Welcome to my kitchen, John. Please meet my sister Zuhur Al Sabag. Hello, I'm Hello, John. John. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you for inviting me to your home. You're most welcome. We're happy to have you. This is going to be one of those sort of great days where I learn something, a dish I don't know anything about. So we've got the fish that we got this morning from the fish market. Yeah. So what do we do? Uh, first, we put first layer of salt and a uh, little uh, thyme, which is za'atar, we call it. Then we put this part of the fish. We put it at the bottom of this bucket. Then we add the salt. You put it in layers. So that the, it all preserves evenly? Yes. I add the last part is uh, little uh, thymes. Za'atar? Za'atar. And that's it. That's it? That's it. Uh, we seal it, and then we put it outside in the sun for one month. One month? One month. Yes. You've got to make sure you seal that very well, otherwise your neighbours are going to be really upset. It's in London, I'm going to find that very hard to make because I don't have sun. As long as it is kept in a warm place, that's it. I live in England. Have you been to England? <laughs> <laughs> and just like all the best cookery shows, here's one they prepared earlier. In here is all the salted fish that's been there for a month. Yes. Do I, am I allowed to lift the lid? Yes, yeah. you are. Can I? Yes. Sure? Yes, yeah. sure. 
Go ahead. One, two, three. Oh, look at that. So that liquid on top is all the liquid being sucked out of the fish. It has changed colour in the same way as if you would cure beef. It is just fish and salt and thyme and thyme with an I-M-E. That is it. One month later, you've got fish preserved. And it smells incredible. It smells like the sea. Shall we start now? Yes, we can start. What are we cooking? Tahta uh, malih. What's tahta mean? It means the the fish or is at the bottom and, and then the rice is on the top. OK. I do as I'm told and I pour my expertly chopped onions into a pan of warm butter. Whoa, look at that. Dried limes are crushed and added. That salting process has preserved the fish beautifully, but washing most of it off is crucial to avoid overpowering the flavour. And this is the mare, but you soak this in water? Yeah. For how long? Uh, 12 hours, I change the water uh, four times. To get rid of all that salt? Yes. It's quite meaty, very solid. Nazak then drops in the cloves yeah. and the black peppercorns. The sisters are very secretive over their blend of spices. That's it. Uh, what she puts in oh, there. Oh, I can smell, I can smell cumin, coriander, a little bit of turmeric, maybe a little bit of cinnamon. She's saying, yeah. <laughs> yeah? Not bad? Not bad. <laughs> Not bad for an old man. Uh, Next, a clever little here. trick. Can we? Yes. I'll just put little rice so I don't burn my malih. Is this how you get the crispy bottom? Yeah. What's happened now is put a little layer of rice first, so that sits on the bottom, then the fish, then the more rice. And what will happen is that little layer of rice should stay at the bottom and go crispy. Crispy rice bottom. Some turmeric with water goes onto the rice topping. And I like the sound. You know, nothing in life is any good unless it makes a noise. Yeah. Lots of noise. It talks to you, right? Yes. Food talks to you, but you've got to listen to it sometimes. And it's ready to serve. Male, salted fish, Emirati style. Look at this for a feast. It smells fantastic. Thank you. The rice is lovely and soft, but the fish is really soft. And there's no salt at all. And it's, um, it's almost smoky. I'm really surprised by it. Simply delicious. Rice and fish. They always say the best food in the world is in the home. We'll come to England and cook it for you. Uh. And during uh, an English summer. <laughs> <laughs> So you might know Dubai as tall buildings and fast cars, but actually this is where it all began. This is Dubai Creek. On either side, the markets, the souks. It was all about trading bits and pieces, be it gold or textiles, and even spices. And that's where I'm off to. I'm meeting food entrepreneur Mo. He's very familiar with these spice markets, having grown up in a household passionate about home cooking. So you're going to show me around? I am, I am. Look, we're going to spend some time in the shade, so it's not going to be as hot as you think. Well, it's pretty hot. Mo's already invited me to his parents' house this evening to break the fast and enjoy a traditional Emirati iftar meal. So, I'm already thinking this is the ideal place to find a gift. What is it about Emirati cuisine and spices? What is, what is individual to it? The spices that we use here are influenced by the Indian subcontinent, by Iran, by Saudi Arabia, Iraq. Africa. So what happened was when those people arrived, they brought their food with them and they brought their trade with them. So in this area, you'll find the spice market. This is where it all happened. And now they've even got air conditioning in here, <laughs> which makes it a little bit more comfortable than wandering just the streets. They imported that too. <laughs> I've never seen turmeric like that before. That is turmeric, isn't it? That's, yeah. This is dried whole turmeric. Can I snap that? Yeah. <gasps> No, I can't. All right, we're... That's, that's hilarious. Cut, I can't even break cut, it in a... Cut. We're going to the gym. I'm <laughs> going to try this one. That is one. so... Oh, OK. Fair enough, then. That's OK. We are here for a reason, and you're going to make us a spice mix. So where do we start? I don't even know what half these spices are, but I'm happy to see that bag getting loaded up. So every one of these shops has a slightly different spice mix. So this is his personal blend. So all of this goes into a grinder and gets blitzed into a powder. That, for me, is more exciting than a bag full of sweets when you go to the cinema. You know, people get pick and mix. That, to me, is my <laughs> pick and mix. 
That is a spice mix to behold. Come on, then. What can the next shop have that could possibly top that? Oh. John, so you're going to love this. You know, foodies love this. So this is top grade Iranian saffron. This is more expensive than truffles or anything you could imagine. Saffron is more expensive than gold per kilo. I mean, that shows how expensive it really is. And each one of those is the individual stamen of a crocus plant. There are millions, millions of hand-picked dried stamens in there. This is like one of those life-defining moments. That is about a thousand quid. I've never seen that quantity of saffron before in my life. How about saffron? Wow. I'm in Dubai, sampling the traditional food of the Emiratis. I'm lucky enough to have been invited to my new friend Mo's house for a traditional iftar meal. So after a long day of fasting for Ramadan, we'll all be eating together at the family home. Welcome, John. Well, how are you? Come on in. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, my mom's in the kitchen, so she's expecting us and she's going to put us to work. So, heads up. Hello. 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 But only fair if I come to somebody's kitchen. I have a gift for you. Thank Soraya, you so thank you very much. much. That's for you. Very nice. Thank you very much. Let's grind. Let's grind. I thought he'd never ask. Smell that. That's crazy, right? Yeah. The difference in that is the smell is quite incredible to what I'm used to. <sighs> and it's slightly hot. <laughs> is it spicy? Yeah, it's spicy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hot. It's coriander and cumin. There's spice of chilli. I'm never, ever going to buy spices in a jar of again. I thought I bought plenty of spices with me, but look at the amount of food Mo's mum is preparing. There's chicken, there's meat, there's rice, there's stuff everywhere. How many different dishes will you cook tonight? Every day, five or six kind I will cook. Five or six. Spoiled children, that's what it is. So, it's a special occasion, so that means the spices have come out. This is my mom's recipe. I... So you trying to tell me that my spice mix isn't good enough? <laughs> this is the problem, isn't it? It's not big enough, John. How long is that going to take for you to use that bucket of spice mix? Three kilo of that. One year I use it. Wow, three kilos of spice a year. That's a lot of cooking. Am I allowed to get a jar of that to take away to be able to cook with my fish? My mom's one step ahead of you. She's already put them in jars for you. Has she? She has. Can I take the bucket? <laughs> That's mate. Thank you very much indeed. The main courses, all five of them, are already cooked. So I'm going to help with dessert. So the, the recipe apparently is called La Gamat. Like you, I have no idea what this is going to turn out like. Um, so in here, you've got some yeast, yeah, water and sugar. Yes. And you leave that for five minutes. Yes. So that the yeast starts to activate. Yes. That's one heaped spoonful of corn flour she's added and two spoons of yogurt. Then goes in one more cup of water. Next in goes a cup full of wheat flour and give it a stir. So it's a batter. I can see it's a batter. And here's a surprise ingredient. It's cardamom. Baking powder and baking soda. Yeah. It's going to be as light as anything, this. It'll be like a cloud. Shall I mix it? OK. <laughs> is that enough? Yes. It sits expanding for 20 minutes under that plate until it looks like this. It's quite a loose batter. It's not, it's not like a donut dough. And Soraya has just put on a rubber glove. Who knows why? Because she hand drops little balls of dough into the heated oil. What never fails to surprise me is, with food like this, the simplicity. There's no fancy implements, there's no machines, there's no piping bags, there's nothing like that at all. It's just somebody popping the doughnuts over in the oil. So the dough like this, it's quite dense, which means the oil can't be too hot, because if it's too hot, they don't cook in the centre and they don't puff up enough. They're a doughnut. My turn. Trust me, I'm a doctor. 
Don't try this at home. It's okay? okay You're you. being too kind to me, aren't you? You're a ship, you ask me? No, no, I'm, I'm <laughs> learning. I've never done this before. You tell me. I'm trying to make these, each one of these, small and perfectly round. That's the objective. Presently, by every shape, but round. Oh. Oh, I think I've got it. It's quite a quick little drop. Look at this, this, look, this, look, this, look. These are all perfectly you round. You also, yeah. yeah no. You did one. I did one. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I got one. Tomorrow you come back. <laughs> <laughs> This is saffron water that's been mixed with some sugar syrup, saffron donuts. What is that? Pistache. Pistache. Pistache nuts. Pistache powder. Lagay nuts with saffron syrup and pistache nuts. That's dessert. Obviously, I'd like to eat those right away. But first, there's the matter of a massive iftar meal with Mo's family to break their day of fasting for Ramadan. John, you're sitting with me. Sitting with you. So I can take care of you. Thanks. Because if you sit next to my mom, she'll just fatten you up. <laughs> I'm already there. OK. So the way it works is you break your fast with the date. It's a nice sugar hit to have after a long day of fasting. So, so here's what's going to happen, John. Everybody's just going to give you so much food. It's going to come from so many different directions. OK. And you, you won't know what to do. I've got food sweat already. <laughs> I've just about left room for a couple of Soraya's donuts. Where's the saffron legama? There's only one. <laughs> That's mine. <laughs> I don't want that one. That's date syrup. This is my one. That's your problem. <laughs> my favourite thing, saffron. Oh, look, there's that. one left. <laughs> you should have taken before. But look, here is the lesson. I've got to say, whilst you're here, <laughs> you've got to eat really fast or you don't eat at all. <laughs> the soft inside, crispy outside, sweet, sticky, saffron flavour, pistachio-rich, wonderful donut. Magic carpet right in the bowl. OK, I'll be back the same time tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> that was an incredible eating experience, and I'm off to make a dish my own. I'll need one or two things from the market. Two of these, please, two that size. Before I head to the Waldorf Astoria, who have loaned me a kitchen. Having been inspired by the food of the Emirates, I'm going to make you some grilled fish with saffron potatoes and a herb salad. I've learned that the Emiratis like herbs with their main courses, and that's why the saffron I have fallen in love with the amount of saffron I've seen through the streets. To bring the best out of the saffron, I'm going to toast it. Remember that each one of these is a singular strand of a crocus flower, and it should be treated with real reverence. I add salt and a generous helping of olive oil to the pan. Now for lots and lots of garlic, and I mean lots. Now shallots. I just cut them into six pieces. Let the onions just soften a little bit. And it's not about frying them, it's more like it's boiling them in oil, which might sound incredible, but they will go lovely and soft. They'll take on the flavour of the saffron and they'll take on the flavour of the garlic. Take some parboiled potatoes, small ones, cut them in half, and just drop in. Whilst that cooks away, some tomatoes, chopped. And believe it or not, some more oil. I add some coriander seeds, chilies, and pickled lemons. Spring onions follow. See the colour of the saffron now. The colours are amazing. As those potatoes and tomatoes and saffron cook together, the fish. Whole fish. This is a piece of bream I bought from the market. I've had it gusted, I've had it cleaned, I've had it ready to go. And it's now about making sure the fish is cooked evenly. And that means I've got to score it. Score it all the way through the flesh to the bone, the backbone, but keep the actual belly whole, otherwise it will fall apart in the grill. And then 
a little bit of oil, take the spice, spring it across the top and rub it in, rub it into those slits. This is Soraya's spice mixed with fennel seeds in it to bring out the flavour of the fish. On the grill it goes. I'm going to ask everybody to cook fish for half as long as you think it needs to be cooked for. So a piece of fish like that, people might think 20 minutes. That's going to take 10 minutes at the most, five minutes each side. Listen to it, let it colour, let the flames dance around a little bit and just look after it. I make a herb dressing for the fish using spring onions, dill, coriander, mint, parsley and tarragon. Just give it a bit of a squeeze together. It's going to release all that flavour and all that aroma. To that, a little tiny bit of olive oil, a sprinkle of salt and a squeeze of lemon juice. Now to put it together on a plate. Look at that. As happy as Larry he is. And there you have it, spiced grilled fish, saffron potatoes and a herb salad. For me, the true flavour of the Emirates. What I've discovered on this culinary journey of the Middle East is beyond the architecture and the luxury of Dubai sits a fascinating yet traditional Emirati cuisine. It's born out of the seafaring traders of spice and the richness of the Gulf, and all in a place where the desert meets the sea.